All right, Bob. So the most startling stat that you sent out this week, and I read everything that you send me, was I was kind of shocked by this, but baby boomers now are not going to be the majority voting block. It's the first time in 30 years. In fact, if you take the collective Gen Zs and millennials, they're actually going to be a larger voting block at 65 million people versus 50 million baby boomers. And no surprise, but their three major concerns are inflation, healthcare, and housing. I'm actually a little surprised that student debt's not part of that as well. But I guess to some extent, it's not a surprise given what prices we've seen uh, on healthcare and housing, especially recently. Well, you know, as, you, as we all discussed last week in a previous podcast, inflation, price increases, really impacting everybody, whether you're a millennial or a baby boomer. Um, and I think that you're going to see uh, both blocks. You know, we're going to see a big turnout in this election, like we did the the election four years ago, because these are really big concerns right now. Well, you know, I can speak for my group of friends who straddle the Gen X uh, millennial gap, and I know a lot of them are very concerned. You know, a lot of them are trying to expand their homes because they're having more children, and also trying to save for college. So, you know, those those price increases and the value of housing going up really is uh, is putting a strain on them. Yeah, I think housing has absolutely been a big hot topic. You're seeing that just on social media with my day-to-day friends. I mean, everybody is starting to feel the fact that they're getting priced out of the housing market because it's getting so expensive. Interest rates are so high. And it's absolutely a hot topic now as you're getting this new generation who's having kids. To Chris's point, they're now getting bigger families. But those people who have bought houses kind of feel stuck in these lower interest rate mortgages they have. They can't upsize anymore. The ones who don't have houses feel like they can't get in. That's like a big topic right now, which I think is likely going to be a big uh, source of debate as we get closer to the election. It's kind of crazy. We put a, put a video out. I was interviewing this woman on the street and I asked her, are we in a recession? And she said, no, we're not in a recession, which technically she's right. But man, oh man, if you saw the hate this woman received online in the comments section, um, you know, for saying that we're not in a recession and I get it. And we talked about that vibe session, uh, according, I think that was from one of your, your CNBC appearances is people just feel like because the price of food, energy and healthcare, um, and shelter, uh, are going up so much and wages have not really kept pace with that. It feels like, well, we're not really getting ahead. So how can we possibly not be in a recession right now? And meanwhile, that's why it makes it so difficult to be a great investor because we're in a big booming bull market guys, right? We're just... You know, we've had maybe a 2% correction in the S&P so far this year. Uh, At some point, earnings are going through the roof. And one of the reasons why earnings are going up is because the cost of doing business is actually going down. The cost of lumber is going down. Copper is going down. Wheat, corn, soybeans. And, you know, prices haven't dropped anywhere, right? So everybody's concerned they're paying higher prices, but companies are are taking that to the bottom line. So we're seeing big earnings increases. We just saw an all-time record high in earnings estimates for the coming quarter. Well, you know, Dad, I heard a rumor that Ryan's going to cut wages, but increase fees. Is that what you're talking about? (laughs) I feel like I'm paying you, uh, Courtney, I'm I'm not paying you enough, but Chris and Bob, man, oh man, talk about overhead. (laughs) Talk about lack of productivity for uh, for the dollars I'm paying. So, uh, boys, we need to talk. We need to renegotiate your salaries this year. Hey, Ryan, I don't really have time to talk for another six to eight months. So, you know, I'll get you on the calendar then. (laughs) Yeah, but you know what, Chris, you know what's going to happen over the next six to eight months with this election coming up? Both sides are going to emphasize every negative. So, all these concerns are going to become certainties, right? On top of all the difficulty we have right now with inflation and the cost of housing, um, wages, you know, everything's going to be emphasized to the negative, right? Which makes it even harder, you know, to be a smart investor. And I think just as a reminder to anyone who's looking to invest or anybody who's worried about inflation is the best way to keep pace with inflation is by having your money growing faster than inflation. And one of the best ways you can do that is make sure your money is invested in some having a portion in the stock markets, which do tend to outpace inflation. So obviously that's where your risk tolerance comes in. You need to have a plan. That's why you can talk to people like us. But having that portion there, that's the best thing you can do to keep pace with inflation. Yeah, I think what Courtney's trying to say is cash is trash. <laughs> so, and it's true, right? I mean, even at 5% uh, in a money market fund this year, you're still not outpacing uh, what the market has done, right? This year and last year, especially when you factor in taxes and again, the cost of living being around 3%. But I think also, like, you got to keep your eye on the prize here. First off, oddly enough, in an election year, markets tend to go do well, they tend to go up, uh, maybe a little more volatile around the election. But, you know, those big, great themes uh, that we kind of focus on week after week are continuing to go in the right way. Right. And we have inflation continue to moderate. Shelter costs are a lag in that inflation number. We know shelter costs are going to continue to cool. I don't think they're going to cool that much, but 
but enough to bring that inflation number down. Um, in addition to that, the labor market, because we have a labor shortage, a big part of it is still relatively strong, right? It's cooled off a little bit, but we still have full employment, the best employment numbers we've seen really since like the 1960s. So that combination is not a bad combination looking forward. Yeah, I know, but it just, it just blows my mind, right? Think of that number, guys. Six plus trillion dollars sitting in money market funds in one month, two month treasuries. I talk to wealthy people. I talk to not so wealthy people. I talk to smart people. I talk to not so smart people. And they're going, well, Bob, I'm getting 5%. I don't have to worry about the volatility. And, you know, I know where my money's going to be. Meanwhile, if you got dividends closing in on 3%, you got municipal bonds paying 4% tax free and throw in a little bit of appreciation. Suddenly you're at 10%. You know, eight to nine, ten percent on average return, and you're sitting there saying, "Oh, I'm so happy! I'm getting five percent." Well, you know, a lot of things. One thing people I really haven't noticed is that over the last month, the ten-year Treasury's come down about seven percent. It really has. That yield's dropping, Chris. So the bond gods are telling us that rates are coming lower. And think what happens. You know, and we talked about this a, a lot of times. Where's that six trillion going, guys? Where is it going to go when you're sitting there watching everybody else become wealthy and you're sitting there with your paltry return? I heard Ryan has been advising his clients to put it all on NVIDIA, but I could be wrong about that. <laughs> um, no, the FOMO trade is real. And I think, you know, you can never discount human emotion, right? Um, and we talk about this a lot, but just how, how negative investors were not that long ago. You know, markets were sideways for quite a bit. They were sideways all the way up until last fall. And then, bam, right out of the blue, markets surged up. And now, all of a sudden, investors are kind of, you know, they're kind of moving from they're very, very fearful. Now, the pendulum starting to you know, kind of move over to it's a little bit more greedy by the minute and the higher markets go, investors tend to get even more greedy and more crazy when it comes to their investment strategy. And that's why it's so important to keep your head on straight right now. Well, Rob, you sent a, a great stat the other day, you know, just talking about some of these companies that are overvalued and more likely a lot of this money that's in cash will probably go into those. But any company that trades historically over 15 times sales historically tends to lag the market by 18%. Hey, Chris, try 28% over the next five years. Um, that's why you got to be so careful right now because, you know, we talk about this almost every week, but it's better to leave the party early. It's terrible to leave the party late. Um, and unfortunately, no one's going to tell you when the party's about to end. And, you know, so as long as I've been in the business, maybe Bob has a crystal ball now. I'm not sure. Well, I always notice that you leave the party early and never say goodbye. <laughs> the Irish goodbye, brother. <laughs> hey, you know what it sounds like today, guys? Um, you know, you're looking at the cost of housing being too high, prices of everything too high, inflation is moderating, but prices are too high. Who's benefiting from this, right? Don't get mad, get even. The way to get even is to be fully invested because corporations, they're not just going up because AI is going to be the future. They're going up because the cost of raw materials is going down. Interest rates are falling, right? Inflation's moderating. Their profits are going up. Unless you found somewhere where they dropped their prices, I haven't. Their prices are the same, but the cost of doing business is going down. Earnings are going up. Earnings are the mother's milk of stocks. Make sure you get your piece of the action. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 153, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, and you want a more hands-on approach, Bob, Chris, and I now have a collective 75 years helping individuals just like you with your planning and investing. This is what we do every single day. We'll put together for you a total financial master plan. We'll do a bird's eye view of your entire financial life and hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. There's not a firm out there that will do this work up front. In fact, we'll build you your own personalized financial portal. We'll go through and look at everything you need from an income plan for retirement. How do you draw from your portfolio? How do you take social security? We'll do a full deep dive of your total portfolio. Look at your diversification. Have you had way too much money in the market? Have you seen your portfolio go up and down like a yo-yo or have you been sitting in cash, paralysis by analysis, can't figure out what to do? We'll put together a full investment game plan. We'll show you how to grow your wealth, tie it to your goals, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, insurance product, structured product, brokerage product. We'll do a deep dive of all those investments, show you how to reduce the cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's now what you make. It's what you take. You'll get a full tax playbook. If you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, simply go to www 
paintcm.com slash financial plan or click on the link below to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E. Having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And guys, we're going to go old school again today. We're going to do what we call spotlight, where we take a real case we worked on and we dissect it. And we just look at the flaws uh, with regards to the actual financial plan. And Courtney, you worked on one recently. Why don't you give us the rundown? Yeah. And this was a case where a couple is nearing retirement the next year or two. And so they want to make sure that their plan is set up as they're nearing retirement. And we found a lot of things in this case, which we kind of see over and over again. And so I think it's important to highlight these to make sure you're aware in case you're seeing this in your portfolio as well. I think some of the big things we saw where number one, they were overexposed, making too much risk in things like Apple, Google, NVIDIA, which we see over and over again. And number two, they were shocked at how much they were paying in fees that they had no idea about. So how come they didn't, weren't aware of that? I mean, they weren't aware, number one, of what they had, what they owned. I mean, I think they know why they own it, but they're not sure what they own. And they didn't know what the cost of ownership was How's that possible? Yeah. And the big thing is this, this client actually has like a play account. Like they wanted to own a little NVIDIA, a little Apple, which I'm okay with having a portion there, but they didn't realize is they had some funds and these have fancy names to them, whether it's a total stock market fund, a freedom fund, whatever it is, we actually broke it down. And I showed you all of the funds that are all owning those same things. So you might've owned a few shares of NVIDIA on your own. You didn't realize you had three times as much as what you were owning outright in all of these fancy fund names. And you just have to add those together to figure out where you are. So you sort of did a CAT scan, MRI, and x-ray of their portfolio, like my doctor did in my body the other day. And he said, hey, Bob, you look good on the outside. So I think that was probably kind of the same thing, right? That this portfolio looks good on paper until yeah. you actually get in there and start digging. Well, it reminds me, Bob, the old uh, saying, if the, if the brochure for the product, the nicer it is, the more high fees and more tax inefficient the product is. <laughs> Right, the more of a veneer that to put on top of it, and I think that's part of the problem. Like to your point, is he has accounts everywhere. You know, you and I worked on this together. Um, they have like literally count it. They have like seventy different funds. Mm -hmm. and, like who knew seventy different funds? Which feels like this is diversified. You start looking to the funds, and you see the stocks that are owned. It's all the same names. So you end up thinking you're diversified, but in reality you have all the money concentrated in the same place. And I think most people have to make that mistake. It's so common. When you're asking about how they didn't know the fees that they were paying, all of those funds that Ryan is mentioning had underlying costs to them as well. And we call these hidden fees because unless you're going to go through those long brochures they send you in the mail or you're going to look online, it's a little hard to find these. They're not line itemed on your statement. But every fund has a fee associated with them. And that is above and beyond anything your advisor may be paying you. And this advisor was not very transparent about their fees. We had to do some digging there as well. They had no idea how much they were paying. Yeah, I mean, in all fairness, these companies, by law, you know, according to SEC regulation, mail prospectuses, right? They mail them quarterly, semi-annually. Sometimes you make a new purchase. But, um, you know, I have a hard time getting through all those. I can't imagine the average investor would want to take the time to dig through to know what page to look at. Uh, to tell them what their costs are. Yeah, what are you talking about, Dad? If you ever go on Ryan's bookshelf, it's full of prospectuses. <laughs> it's like his favorite thing to read on the beach. But uh, but yeah, I mean, cost is huge. But the other thing I noticed too is a lot of these are mutual funds, Courtney, and you know the tax and efficiency costs them more money as well. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that with mutual funds, but they're actually going to pay you out capital gains every single year, whether you sell that fund or not. And this has actually happened in the past where you have had a year, the stock markets are down, but sometime within that year, they sold something in the fund at a profit and you're paying capital gains taxes, even though your stocks were down the previous year, which is crazy. So that's why a lot of people and we recommend ETFs as opposed to mutual funds, because you can decide in what year you want to take those capital gains, not leave it up to the fund. Yeah. It's like uh, Bob says, head you lose, tails you lose. That's a bad deal. Um, the other thing that's interesting too, we talk about reinvestment risk and we see this all the time is, you know, of the portfolio, which is a couple million dollars, a half a million dollars is just in a short term CD getting 5%, which is awesome. But, you know, as we talked before, the reinvestment risk there is huge, right? Because if the Fed does cut rates later this year and all of a sudden like order of your portfolio now gets reinvested at a lower rate, um, it's not like you can go back and lock in to the rates that you have today later, right? You can't do it retrospectively. I haven't, I haven't figured out how to do that yet. So, you know, one of the things that we really urge 
or recommend is start locking into some of these yields. You're at a 15 year high in interest rates, like don't have all your money short term. And we see this week after week. And don't forget that that money that you have sitting in a CD, which is getting you the 5%, you're paying taxes on. And this particular couple that we spoke with lives here in New York, which is a high tax state, and they have a high income. So when you actually look at what you're getting at the end of the day, it is not 5%. And that's why you want to make sure that it's not just what you get at the end of the day, it's what you take home at the end of the day. And after taxes, especially in your states like California or New York, which are higher tax states, you want to make sure you're keeping that in mind. I don't know if there's a case here, Courtney, but it seems like a lot of cases that we've run, we've seen where if they just convert that income from taxable to tax-free, it you know sustains their retirement uh, without taking more risk. Uh, so it's it's cost and taxes. If you if you put those into the equation, in, in many cases, most people we meet can take less risk and achieve those goals at an earlier period. That's a great point too, Bob. It's just you know what we looked at here is. You know, we know the Social Security that this gentleman is going to get. He's got a small pension. And we figure out how we can optimize the income on the portfolio, too. And, Chris, you, know, you once told me that uh, you know, income is much more sure than if the market's going to go up on any given year. Um, you know, so I, I kind of been following that for a long time. Well, I, you know, right. I think my, my statement is you get a better outcome with income. And, uh, yeah, I mean, income is, is way more dependable, you know, especially if you have a market like we had in 2022, uh, 2008, you know, companies are still making profits. They're still paying those dividends. And if you own good quality bonds, they're still paying that interest. You know, that's money you can rely on. Yeah. I think reliability is a great word to use. It's like, how reliable is your portfolio? Because the portfolio that's just jam packed with those awesome AI stocks. Well, it's great right now, but we know that's extremely unreliable. You know, there's years where semiconductor stocks and tech stocks do terrible and unfortunately, man, my crystal ball, it broke like 20 uh, plus years ago. So I can't tell you when exactly that's going to happen. And that's the problem with this guy right now and his wife is, man, oh, man, we get a big sell off in those big growth companies that could derail his entire retirement. But it's like no pressure. Well, a lot of times this happens, guys, because people keep moving to goalposts. If you took the same couple 20 years ago and said, hey, right when you're at 65, ready to retire, you're going to be set for life. You're going to have every dime you need. All you have to do is preserve it in a balanced portfolio that has a high probability of success. Are you going to say, nah, I think maybe I'll just roll the dice for another year or two to see how it works out? Who wants to gamble their lifestyle uh, when they're going into retirement? And that's what bull markets, momentum-driven bull markets do to people. They make them financially insane. One other big thing that we notice with this client is they're currently in a high tax bracket, but about to retire. And they're still several years away from when they need to take their required minimum distributions. They have done a really good job of saving into things like 401ks and IRAs. But what that means is once they have to take the money out at 73, their income is going to go right back up again. So they have a few years there where they're going to be in a low tax bracket. And that's where something called a Roth conversion is going to make a lot of sense. You have these golden years where your income is suddenly going to go down. We can get some money out of your IRAs at a low tax bracket, convert it into a Roth for tax-free growth, and start to minimize the amounts that you need to take later. This is a perfect case for that. And if you're nearing retirement, still a little ways away from your RMDs, that might be a case for you as well. Yeah, it's also a really great uh, estate planning tool as well, because now if you inherit anything that's pre-tax, you have to distribute it within 10 years, and that can create a really large tax burden for your heirs. Exactly. And those Roths as well, they're going to go tax-free to your heirs, given some time constraints. But yes, exactly. As uh, a wise man once said, money saving taxes, just as green as any money you can make invested. All right, the hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, Americans filed 5.5 million applications to form a new business last year, the most ever. Who says entrepreneurship is dead in America? Hey, Rod, when you have a big booming stock market, it's supported by a big booming economy. And one of the greatest wealth generators in the history of the planet is owning your own business. Not everybody's wired for it. But it looks like 5.5 million Americans are right now. And I say like kudos to the younger generation because a lot of the younger generation, I think, is very, very open to opening their own businesses, being more entrepreneurial. I know we say always say like we like to trash uh, Gen Z, um, but it's great to see that entrepreneurship is alive and well here in the United States. 
makes me proud to be an American. All right, Courtney, I know you talked about this stock recently on CNBC. Hims and Hers Health Incorporated is now up almost 150% this year. One of the few stocks outside of the AI space that's almost keeping up with NVIDIA. Uh, it has long specialized in the sort of conditions that patients may not want to disclose in the, the doctor's office, in the front office by the staff, addressing issues like impotence, uh, herpes, balding, anxiety, pimples, and weight loss. Man, oh man, it's either AI, I guess, or some sort of drug that can fix everything. Yeah, hims and hers is very interesting. They've really cut out this good niche for themselves and have a really good client base. Um, what's interesting is just as much as AI, it's all of the excitement in the tech world, the AI of the healthcare space has been those GLP ones or the weight loss drugs. And really anytime that you're able to get into that, you're seeing these stocks do fantastic. You're starting to see that this is a company as they get into those weight loss drugs has a lot more money that they can make as well. And what's driving America? <laughs> Artificial intelligence and drugs that can uh, fix basically any problem you have. Hey, Rye, that's why, uh, that's why we just put weight loss and AI into the name of pain capital management to get a valuation higher. I was going to save that joke for last, Bob, because the stat I want to give Chris <laughs> was 40% of S&P 5 com companies mentioned artificial intelligence on their Q1 earnings calls, uh, hoping that their stock would get a pop is my guess, Chris. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I think I like that idea. I think dad's got a real good point there. We should, we should talk about weight loss and AI. And I think uh, our valuations will go through the roof. Maybe we'll be on the S&P 500 someday. Pain CM dot AI, um, full service, helping you with balding, <laughs> weight loss, and financial services. I think our stock would double in a day. Instead of being an RIA, we'll be an RAI. You know, so oh. just, <laughs> Clever, we'll Bob. Create a whole new category. <laughs> Hope you had enjoyed episode 165, Pain Points of Wealth. Please, if you like our podcast, give us that five-star rating on Apple, on Spotify, you can subscribe. This is on YouTube right now. You can subscribe to our channel. You can click that notification bell to be updated all, every week of all our new content. Your support gives us the ability to continue to do this podcast. Stay loose and keep an open mind. Thanks for listening to The Pain Points of Wealth. Hopefully, you found the ideas discussed in this episode valuable and useful for your own financial journey. You can find out more about Bob, Ryan, and Chris's firm, Payne Capital Management, at BeBullish.com or through the contact information found in the description of this episode in your podcast player or app. Join us next week for another episode of The Pain Points of Wealth, brought to you by Payne Capital Management. Information provided on today's show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Investment is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed. 